Great. Please sit down. And uh, good morning, Lansdowne. Well, on a remarkable Sunday, during a remarkable weekend of celebrations, we have a remarkable text for the occasion. Nathan's words to the young King David in verse 11 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. Here's our text. The Lord will build a house for you. So just for this week, we're departing from our series in Ephesians, which we've entitled, of course, Immeasurably More. And yet in one respect, we're still on message. For our text and the letter of Ephesians are to do with the, the greatest building pro project and wonder of the world. Not the pyramids, not the uh, Grand Canyon, not the Great Wall of China, but the church. Now, you may fall off your pews at that point. You may raise your eyebrows. You may shake your head in disbelief. But it's a fact. God loves the church. We may not always, but God does. It's his idea. He sent his son to die and rise again, to make the church a reality. And in all the cosmos, there is nothing so beautiful, so amazing, or so permanent as the church, the Lord will build a house for you. But before we get to 2 Samuel 7, 17, I want to take you to Joshua 4, verse 6. So if you want to make your fingers to the walking in your Bible, find Joshua 4, verse 6. These are Moses' instructions to the children of Israel as they are about to cross the river Jordan. In the future, he says... When your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. What do these stones mean? That is the big issue, isn't it, for us this very weekend? For 139 years, this building has embedded memories and moments and stories into our lives. And when in 18 months' time we return to a lovely, shiny new facility with comfortable seats and boilers that never break down in the winter, our children will ask the same question. Tell me, tell me, what do these stones mean? As one man from each of the 12 tribes of Israel walked across the dry riverbed and picked up from the Jordan a boulder and carried it to the other side, they were making a huge statement. The God of Sinai, who'd written his word on tablets of stone, which the priests then carried in the ark, was still with them. His people... He had delivered on his promise, had the Lord, to give them a land of their own. He had stopped the river Jordan in full flow, just like he'd held back the waters of the Red Sea. Powerfully and miraculously, God had revealed his glory. You see, that's what those stones meant to generations of Israelites. It was a visual and memorable way of joining the dots of their lives. And I think we need similar connections ourselves to places of significance. We need that uh, download onto the memory hard drive, the events and chapters of life which are often marked by stones. Take the homes in which you've lived over the years or the schools and colleges which you've attended or the holiday de destinations that you've enjoyed and maybe some that you haven't all give us a sense of who we are. Let me tell you about me. As a teenager, I wanted to remember the first major rugby game in front of a big crowd and at a large stadium. So at the end of the game, we'd won, by the way, as I came off the field, I stuffed one of the corner flags down my rugby shorts and up my shirt. Many years later, my daughter, Laura, and I removed the grey Welsh slate house name 
outside the front door, Kyrios, it's cherries in Welsh, before we moved out of that old, lovely Edwardian house in Cardiff. And every move since, I've taken that Welsh grey slate with me. I guess there may be something going on in my life about stealing and pinching things, I don't know. <laughs> but isn't that why some of you are taking a pew with you when this wonderful old building comes down? Because for you, these stones mean something. And, and that's why we've collected the, the, the personal stories of many of you into a booklet and, and also published this, this great history of Lansdowne. It's a remarkable read, as Bev was saying, recording many uh, of the events that took place here. One in particular, Sunday, May the 23rd, 1943, when a German Luftwaffe bomb fell through that roof and went through that window and exploded in the car park opposite. You can read all about that for five pounds. <laughs> and we hope, we hope just this week we had another idea. It wasn't mine, it was somebody else's bright idea. We hope to take 139 of the Purbeck stones from the exterior of this building, one for every year the church has been here, and incorporate them somehow into the new building design. But why? Why, like the children of Israel, why take the past with us in these ways? Well, because for thousands of people, these walls have been a place where God's voice is heard, where God's spirit of peace and forgiveness has been experienced, where the cross has been lifted high, where have faith in God has been more than a text on a wall, but a reality. Where prayer and praise and worship has been offered every Sunday to God, where people all over the world today have found Christ and a spiritual home sitting on the pews that we are now. Let me tell you about one. He emailed me this last week, Rio Rui Franco de Campos. He's a Brazilian civil servant. And about 18 months ago, he saw us on YouTube and decided he wanted to come to the church. So he did. He flew from Brazil and enrolled at a language school here in Bournemouth. And for six months, he learned English. He's back home now, and he emailed me the other day, and he said this, it was a beautiful moment with you when I sat on the bench, I love that, of your church, hearing a lot of beautiful songs, and then he adds in brackets, as well as your sermon. <laughs> Rui asked for two things. I have some unusual requests in my mailbag every week, but this is, this is particularly interesting. First request, please come and preach in my church near Copacabana Beach. Well, that isn't too hard a thing to respond to. <laughs> but then, can you transcribe a few sentences from a soup opera, soap opera, soup opera, that's how he spelt it, bless him, that I've been listening to on the BBC called The Archers. Isn't that great? But you see, for people like Rui, these stones and these seats and these walls are places of belonging. Hundreds have been baptized here over the years. We were seeing yesterday afternoon in one of the videos that over a thousand people have been baptized here in the last 50 years alone. Scores have been married and, of course, buried here. The hatch, match, and dispatch departments have been very busy. And there's one person, you'll hear him tonight, so come tonight to hear this story, who was in the Lansdowne youth group of the 1960s, and he found two wives to marry. I mean, not at the same time, you understand. <laughs> one after the other. You see, folks, there is power in these walls. The power of God to break in and turn despair into hope and turn death into life spiritually and to turn night into day. What do these stones mean? That's Joshua 4, 6. Now let's go to the text itself. This is where the sermon starts. And 2 Samuel 7, 17. The Lord will build you a house. The link between those two texts 
is right there in the opening verse of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 7. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. You see, what happened between Joshua and 2 Samuel? Well, during the intervening centuries, that ark had been, of course, carried across the River Jordan, and then it had moved around Israel from place to place. It had been kept in a, in a makeshift portable tent called the tabernacle. But King David now is at last in a position to give the ark this symbol of God's presence among his people, to give that ark a permanent place to reside. Because as the text of verse 1 says, he has rest from his enemies. The wars are over. He's comfortable in his palace. And he thinks, let's build a temple for the ark of God. Okay, here are three relevant lessons from this passage and text for us as a church. Lesson one, a new day needs a new focus. A new day needs a new focus. David and Israel were going through a major transition from one era, in fact, to the next. And of course, so are we. As the countdown clock ticks towards July the 19th. Now, for Israel, everything here is being centralized into one place. Whereas for Lansdowne, we're about to go in the opposite direction. To become a multi-site church without walls. Until 18 months later, we hope to achieve what David does in 2 Samuel and set up a new HQ. You see, here's the background. Israel's scattered tribes needed cohesion and vision. So David, the king, creates what is in effect a massive change agenda. First, if you know the opening chapters of 2 Samuel, first he moves his capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. Next, he builds a great royal palace in the city. Then as chapter 6 opens, he gathers a royal military household of 30,000 men. And next, he blows the dust from the Ark of the Covenant and relocates it to the city. And finally, in our chapter, he realizes, I've got a lovely home. The Lord God must have a temple. You see, a new day needs a new focus. Seven and a half years of civil war had followed the death of David's uh, predecessor, Saul. Only the southern tribes around Judah had given their allegiance to David initially. Therefore, he was still vulnerable and the nation was greatly divided. Saul's dynasty had an awful lot of support left in the north. But after successive battles, we read that the house of David grew stronger and stronger and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. A new world and new structures were emerging out of the chaos of the past. But that movement for change had its, had its uh, opponents as well as its supporters. And one of David's fiercest critics was his wife, Michal, daughter of Saul. We meet her in chapter 6. She represents the voice of opposition to change. As the ark is carried into the city, she just doesn't get what all the fuss is about. Verse 14 of chapter 6, David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of triumph. She certainly wasn't very happy with the extravagant spending going on in the city. Verse 19, then David gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. You know, when I read that, I reckon they are the ancient equivalents of Nikki King and Grace Eaton in charge of the catering, as we'll experience in about an hour's time or so. But most of all, Michal didn't like David making a fool of himself and being so apparently out of control. Verse 16, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And so in verse 20, 
She laughs sarcastically at David. How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. As far as she was concerned, David looked like an embarrassing granddad on the dance floor at a wedding reception. Where's your reverence, David? Where's your dark suit and tie? You should look suitably miserable. David, of course, has a different view of events. And he tells us his view in verse 21. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. You see, David is a genuinely serious but passionate man. He wants God at the center of the nation's life. He wants to do the right thing. I can hear the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost explaining to the crowds, these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. In God's new day, when God is doing a new thing, often the church doesn't get it, let alone the world. David understood that a new day needed a new focus. And sometimes in such moments of transition, things are going to look out of control and very different. The structures change. The organization adapts. It morphs into shapes and forms which can be unnerving. Things are never the same in God's new day. And when God's new day comes, it will have its advocates, but it will also have its detractors, its critics. In the 18th century, the Church of England authorities kicked John Wesley out of the church and its pulpits and told him to go and stick his crazy ideas about reaching the unchurched up his cassock. So he did. He went into the fields and open air and the Spirit of God used his unconventional methods, dancing before the Lord, to change the nation. History is full of such stories. The Baptist Association told William Carey in the 19th century to sit down and shut up when he suggested that the society should take the gospel of Jesus to India. They thought he was mad. We are a community facing a new day. And with that new day comes a new focus. For 18 months or so, listen, it's going to be messy church. We are literally going to be all over the place. And some of us, I know, are going to find that really difficult to, to cope with. But let me reassure you, a lot of people are working really hard, staff and others, to help you find the right building on the right day at the right time with everything ready. But I want to, I want to appeal to you directly. In this new world, don't stand on the touchline with David's wife. Start dancing like David. By which I mean, be totally available to God. Be willing to live for him and serve him. And maybe look a little crazy in the process. Going the extra mile. Getting out of our comfort zones. Being the church out there on the streets. A new day needs a new focus. So, be prepared for change. There was, of course, one more change that David wanted, and that was a building, a temple for God. And his understandable desire gives us a second key lesson. Good intentions are not necessarily God's intentions. Good intentions are not necessarily God's intentions. Of course God should have a temple and not live in a tent, thought David. 
in the ancient world, any self-respecting nation or king wanted to make it very clear that God was on their side. So when David shares this bright idea of his with Nathan the prophet, he gets an immediate go for it. Look, verse 3, Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord's with you. Now, of course, this is not the Nathan of a few years later who will challenge the king about his car crash of an affair with Bathsheba. He is not speaking truth to power now. He is a yes man on David's royal payroll. You know, I thought about this this week. It is very difficult for a pastor to be a prophet. But that's another issue. The main one here is that, is that the God of Israel is like no other. Which is what the Lord tells the prophet to tell the king. In verses 5 and 7. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded the shepherd, my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? David's good intention contradicts three things. Firstly, it contradicts the nature of God. The glory and power of God cannot be contained in one place. This God is everywhere. He rules the nations. He's the Lord of all the earth. Therefore, you, you can't give God a permanent address. We do like to box God in, don't we? Domesticate him. Tie him down to our building, our denomination, our Baptist club. But you see, God breaks out and moves where he wants to. The second thing that David's good intention contradicts is the nature of the church. <laughs> this mobile God wants a mobile people. I honestly believe that our transition into Lansdowne Without Walls could be the making of us. We have the opportunity of fleshing out one of the great features of the Christian church to be a missions movement sent into the streets and communities of the world, trusting God for each week, not being entirely sure of what is going to happen next, much more engaged with the social contexts around us, whether that's the area there by St. Augustine's or Townsend and Castle Point or the university context of the Lansdowne area. Perhaps we can invest as never before in the value and importance of belonging to one of, our, one of our small groups that are scattered right across the region, seeing how they can be the hub, not just for cozy fellowship, but active mission. And when, by the goodness and grace of God, we come back here, not only will we have replanted in Woodbury Avenue a vibrant congregation, but we, I hope, will continue applying the lessons learned of being a church without walls. The third thing that David's good intention contradicts is his own personal story. Listen to verse 8. Now then, Tell my servant David, Nathan, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. David, God made you, and he will make you. Lansdowne, God made you. God made you 139 years ago when he brought you from nowhere and from nothing. God made you. And God will remake us. 
Friends, this is basic 101 gospel. Who we are and what we are is the result of God's grace, not our merit. We are not self-made people worshiping in a man-made church. God built this church. It wasn't money or expertise. It wasn't eminent Bible teachers. And God will regenerate this place. It won't be our business plan or our sophisticated advertising strategy. It won't be our energy or our talent. David, I took you from the pasture, and I have been with you, and I will make your name great. You see, if we don't understand that, then we don't get the gospel. For the gospel is about what God has done for us, not about what we do for God. Let me put it this way. We do not build the kingdom of God. Jesus never talks about building the kingdom. In the Gospels, we are told to pray for it, to wait for it, to see it, to enter it, to seek and inherit it, to declare and proclaim it, but never to build it. For God builds his kingdom. I took you, I have been with you, and I will make your name great. You see, God is always the author of greatness and the builder of his kingdom. Good intentions are not always God's intentions. So be prepared to be humble. Now, does this mean that God voted against David's regeneration building project? No, far from it. He went right with it. Although, of course, it was David's son Solomon who was the eventual builder. God had much more than a physical building in mind. There's David, he wants a house for God. But God wants so much more for David. And that gives us our third key lesson. Here it is. God's best is always so much better than ours. God's best is always so much better than ours. The Lord declares to you, verse 11, that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. Moving down to verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established, David. Look at the text, listen to the text, forever. You see, God's best is always so much better than ours. This is what we're aiming at. There's the first image. A project of about three million pounds over a timeline of 18 months to build what I'm sure will be a wonderful facility with a thousand-seater auditorium, a sports hall, a coffee shop, and the rest. And here's Lansdowne at night. There we are at night. But I want to say to you that God's plan for Lansdowne is much bigger than that. For he's the God of the immeasurably more. God's real project is people, thousands upon thousands of people, generation upon generation, down through the river of time, caught up in what we are about to do by the grace of God. Your children and grandchildren, your friends and colleagues and neighbors, who right now don't know Christ and may well be even hostile to Christian faith. That's the house that God is wanting to build. And so you see, it is so much more than Purbeck stone and glass and timber frames and furnishings and fittings. So much more. It is lives and hearts and marriages and streets full of people who do not know the transforming love of God to them in Jesus Christ. David needed perspective to see the big plan. And so do we. I may have told some of you this story before. During the construction phase of St. Paul's in London, the architect Christopher Wren came to the site in disguise. He saw workmen moving the heavy equipment, digging down into the dirt, laying the foundations, and he stopped to ask one of them, so what's your job here? Oh, I'm just shifting a lot of bricks every day. That's all. 
You're not, you know, said Christopher Wren. You are building a cathedral. The thing about the Hebrew word for house, Beth, as in Bethlehem, house of bread, is that it can mean a literal house, like a temple, or it can mean a house as in a dynasty, a line of succession, as in the house of Windsor. So when God says here to David, I will build a house for you, that's a play on words. God has both a house to build and a people for your house, David, and your kingdom and your throne will be established forever. That is a giant leap into the future. For if you know your Bible history, the temple that Solomon eventually built was trashed by the Babylonians. The monarchy was destroyed. The nation was exiled. But out of the ruins, a people returned. The temple and the city walls were rebuilt. And centuries later, a man walked along the paths of Galilee and proclaimed the kingdom of God. He claimed to be Israel's true Messiah King and the world's only savior. And the opening gospel of John says that Jesus made his dwelling among us. Literally, Jesus put up his tent in our world. And that Jesus said, I will build my church. Just as God told David, I will build you a house. Friends, this is not our house to build in the end. This is not my church or yours. Long after we are gone, Jesus will be building his church. So when David was thinking of woods and stone, God was thinking about a son for David, Solomon, and then right down the line until his divine son, Jesus, would bring into being a people from every nation under heaven to worship him for all eternity. We're not just shifting bricks around in the next 18 months. We're building a cathedral. You see, David got far more than he could have hoped for. My friends, God's best is always so much better than ours. So be ready, Lansdowne, for more. Be ready for more. For that's how Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3 to the God who can do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, may that amen be real and strong and true for all of us as we embark upon this great adventure together. For you will build the house. And nothing and no one will stand in your way. So may our confidence be in Jesus Christ, our great foundation, in his gospel that sends us into the world. And as we come now in a moment to that corporate prayer of commitment, may we realize that you are calling us together for just a time like this. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, that you are with us and that you will be with us in this new day that needs a new focus. Lord God, we pray that your best for us will be immeasurably more that all we can ask or imagine, in Jesus' name, amen.